Not good enough. Australia is demanding more answers and greater transparency over how Israel managed to launch deadly airstrikes on an aid convoy in Gaza. Israel is blaming poor visibility and a communications stuff-up that hasn't satisfied the Albanese government. I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. Central kitchen workers had done everything by the book, coordinating movements with the Israeli Defence Force, plastering logos all over their three vehicles, and still their convoy was struck, precisely and fatally. Seven people were killed, including Australian aid worker Zomi Frankham. According to its investigation, the Israeli Defence Force says officers tracking the convoy thought they were Hamas vehicles. Critical information apparently didn't go down the chain of command, and the logos, they say, weren't visible at night. Two officers have been removed from their posts and three commanders reprimanded. A necessary first step, says Foreign Minister Penny Wong, but not enough. I'm Tommy with World Central Kitchen and we are here today at the Jordanian uh, Air Military Base. One Australian and six others are dead in Gaza after being struck by an Israeli airstrike. Zomi Frankham was among seven killed while delivering food aid. The 43-year-old was working for World Central Kitchen. When I think of Zomi, it's just like beaming light, almost like, for me, she was like too good to be true. In a, cry, in a time of crisis, you look to the helpers and we've lost a really great one. This is a human tragedy that should never have occurred. That is completely unacceptable. Our thoughts are uh... Prayers and condolences obviously go out to, to, to Zoe's family and to her friends. Humanitarian aid workers must be protected. The World Central Kitchen says the team was travelling in two armoured cars branded with the charity logo and another vehicle without armour. Unfortunately, in the last day there was a tragic case of our forces unintentionally hitting innocent people in the Gaza Strip. This happens in wartime. We say to Mr Netanyahu, uh, you must change course. This is a war situation. Uh, tragedies are occurring all the time. Uh, unfortunately, this has now involved an Australian citizen. And what isn't good enough is the statements that have been made, uh, including that uh, this is just a product of war. Uh, this is against humanitarian law. The Israeli government is only doing what you would expect its people is expecting of them. We need to know how, how this happened. It's not good enough just to say shit happens, that this is war, that people are going to die in a war zone. The Israeli Defence Force inquiry found there'd been a catalogue of errors leading up to the airstrikes on the aid convoy. The army has fired two senior officers who approved the strikes. We want full accountability. Uh, it is, these are necessary first steps. Israel has opened three crossings into Gaza to expand the flow of food and medicine into the region. It comes hours after US President Joe Biden told Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that future support for the war in Gaza depends on Israel doing more to protect civilians and aid workers. Did you threaten to stop military aid to Israel? I asked them to do what they're doing. Are you abandoning Israel? Are you abandoning Israel? And my guest this morning is the Shadow Foreign Minister and Liberal Senate Leader Simon Birmingham. First, let's check what's making news. Another group of suspected asylum seekers has arrived by boat on the remote Kimberley coastline, the third in five months. They were discovered on Friday afternoon at the Wanumble Truscott Air Base. The Australian reports the group includes 15 people from China who have since been flown to Perth. One man is thought to have become separated from the group, though, and police are searching for him in what they've described as extremely remote and challenging terrain. In News Corp papers, Peter Dutton will press on with his plans for nuclear power despite coalition focus group research showing widespread hostility to the idea in the very regions where the plants would go. James Campbell quotes several unnamed coalition sources, raising serious concerns about the saleability of this centrepiece policy to roll out nuclear power plants. 
And the ABC's Matt Doran reports Australian man Robert Pether has penned an open letter from his jail cell in Iraq saying he feels abandoned by the Australian government and fears he'll never get home. Today marks three years since Pether was jailed on what he reckons are trumped up fraud charges. Three Australians who survived their own ordeals jailed overseas have joined the campaign to see him freed. Chung Lei, Kylie Moore Gilbert and Sean Turnell. Well, today marks six months since the Hamas attack, which triggered Israel's invasion of Iraq. Thousands of civilians have been killed, including aid workers. But the strike on this aid convoy has been a pivotal moment. International pressure has piled on. Benjamin Netanyahu has vowed to reopen some aid corridors, but that won't be enough. Joe Biden wants further changes to protect civilians. And the Albanese government is taking a much tougher line now. It will be appointing a special advisor to keep the heat on Israel. Let's see what the panel makes of it. We're joined this week by Karen Middleton, Paul Sakal and Katina Curtis. Very good morning to all of you. So Israel promised to make public uh, its investigation into this, Karen. We haven't seen that yet, but it has made some details yep. public. What do we know so far about what it's found? So, David, we know uh, prior to the findings being discussed, we know that the World Central Kitchen Organisation registered its convoy in advance. So we, we know that they registered details like identities and nationalities of participants, the route, the timing, all of that is, is Israel registered. Israel says they did everything right. Israel says they did everything right. What we know from Israel is they say that the, their commanders identified two gunmen they believed were Hamas terrorists. This appears to have occurred before the convoy left the depot. They identified two gunmen and then it, it says they mistakenly thought those gunmen were in the vehicles and fired on them. And it subsequently also says it was dark and they couldn't see the logos. So it, there seems to be in sort of two stages. They saw gunmen and then they've fired on these vehicles mistakenly thinking the gunmen were in them. So there's been some communication breakdown between the people who have the agreement with World Central Kitchen and the people who ordered the firing. A pretty, big, a pretty big breakdown. Two commanders have been sacked and two yeah. well, other... Dismissed from their posts. Well, dismissed and two, that's the word that's used, and two have been reprimanded. Yeah, so on what happened there, we do have a little bit of um, the Israeli military spokesman talking about this and, 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 and arguing that because it was dark, they couldn't see those logos that we can all see in daylight on the top of the vehicles. The soldiers conducted the strike without any awareness that these were in fact WCK vehicles. At the time, they were certain that they were targeting Hamas. The WCK vehicles were marked with the logo of the WCK organization on the roof. However, the cameras tracking the vehicles from above were unable to identify the logos which were not visible at night. Paul, they've referred to serious operational failures, errors in decision making, uh, you know, the fact that it was dark. None of that explains how those errors and mistakes and so on were actually made. There's still a bit we don't know here. There's a lot we don't know. Um, and I think that's why the government's yet to say that they're satisfied with what we've heard. We're sending this special advisor, uh, hopefully, the government wants to send a special advisor over this week to kind of monitor what Israel is. Um, is, is doing in terms of its investigation. That's a big step internationally. And just explain that to us. It's not conducting any fresh investigation, but it's no. basically trying to keep the pressure on Israel. Yeah, answers. the government wants to show that we're not going to forget about this anytime soon and we want to make sure they're doing a thorough job. We're the only country uh, who had a person die in this attack who's taken this step. Um, Penny Wong, in her call with the foreign minister the night before Albanese spoke to Netanyahu, was extremely strong. She said the Australian community might start losing, uh, start believing that there's no merit in this war. You need to think about your international reputation. There's a lot we still don't know. Um, Penny Wong's delivering a big speech on Tuesday at the National Security College here in Canberra. Um, there'll be a lot of observers waiting to see if her language strengthens there to kind of up the pressure on Israel. So I think there's still a bit to play out and there's talks between the countries behind the scenes who are involved in this attack about unifying their actions potentially to make their calls more emphatic on this. Yeah, I mean, Penny Wong spoke yesterday expressing concern that they still haven't got the report, that they still want more answers, they want more accountability, they want more transparency, as you say, not satisfied with what Israel's provided uh, so far. She was also asked uh, about whether there's a, a need here for charges to be laid. I think uh, what I have said uh, is that appropriate action has been taken. That's what we need to ensure, that appropriate action is taken. 
uh, well, 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 I'm, I'm not ruling anything on in or out. Uh, that would be a, a question as to whether the facts merited that. And Penny Wong, Katina, also says if there's a problem with the rules of engagement that Israel's following here, they need to change as well. I mean, look, she is being a little careful, I suppose, in um, how far she's willing to go here. Yeah, I mean, she's clearly saying we need to wait and see kind of the outcome. Um, as Paul's saying, like, we are putting in these sort of monitoring processes to try and make ourselves satisfied. The, the clear message from the Australian government has been that they're not satisfied with what's happened so far in terms of process and sort of the transparency of the investigation. They'd like a bit more oversight. Um, and, and then I guess maybe then we'll see um, perhaps more emphatic language if they think that it warrants it. And, and Karen, has this been a trigger for the Australian government to now be more critical of Israel in generally how it's conducting this war? They are saying publicly what they were saying privately. So they are, I think they and, and other countries are saying more forcefully in public, raising more forcefully in public their concerns about the, is Israel's response to what the international community have raised in terms of the humanitarian mm. toll in Gaza and the way the war is being conducted. On this incident, I think one of the big questions that it doesn't answer is, given the World Central Kitchen did everything right and registered the convoy. How did that information not get down to the people who ordered the strike? Somewhere there was a breakdown. So that system doesn't work. And it raises the question, what is the worth of these so-called deconfliction arrangements, which are life and death for the aid convoys, the people in the aid convoys, are, they are relying on the assurances Israel gives them when they collect the information. Yes, we know this information. Yes, we won't fire on you. That is the implication. And yet it happens. So there's a breakdown there. We've heard Israel say it was a mistake. We've also heard them say, but sometimes we think there are terrorists on board, which implies that they don't always accept the information that they're given. These things need to be explained. So even if you register and do all the right things... What, if something, if they, they fired think... on these vehicles. So somewhere, the information didn't get through that these were World Central Kitchen vehicles because they were relying on the drones to be able to see the logos. So somewhere, the information that these vehicles well, were going yeah. at this time didn't get through. A lot of people would be scratching their heads too about why they can't see it in, in, in the, the dark. dark. Well, I in mean, the this dark is... a highly is... advanced, high-tech military power. Does hu humanitarian law not apply in the dark? Do... What, what, yeah, it, I don't think there's a daylight caveat on the obligations of a country at war to uphold international law and to uphold the to hold, uphold the arrangement it makes with organisations like this. They apply whether it's night time or daytime. The, the opposition here, um, they agree this is a tragedy. They agreed on the need for a full, thorough, transparent investigation. But we also heard an echo of Benjamin Netanyahu's line that this happens in war. Those mistakes happen in, in an environment such as war, and I think we just need to be careful about how far we take that. Well, certainly, uh, tragedies do happen in war, and mistakes do happen in war. Well, you know, these are situations of war. Yeah, Paul, what did you make of that tone from the opposition? Yeah, well, I mean, it's... They are potentially jarring things to hear when an Australian... Uh, heroic Australian has just died. But accidents do happen in war. I mean, the Biden administration ordered an attack after the Afghanistan pullout a few years ago. Um, they hit the wrong place. It killed a family of ten, seven of whom were children. There was not outrage in the Australian media then. Um, there are analysts who point out that the um, civilian to terrorist ratio of deaths in Fallujah and Mosul, where allied forces were fighting, were much higher than in Gaza. Um, but it is still the case that I think the coalition risks being isolated on this. You see Trump, uh, Chris Luxon in New Zealand, the new Conservative leader, Rishi Sunak, David Cameron, all using much more strong language than the coalition does. So the coalition needs to make sure they're not putting domestic politics ahead of Australia's international standing, as they were accused of doing with the China issue last term, just for their own credibility. Um, they are taking on some water in migrant communities where they need to try and win votes, and I think coalition MPs know that, but they're not, they're not going to shift on their principled position of countering the terrorist group Hamas. Well, just on that shifting international um, sentiment towards Israel that you mentioned there, I spoke on the podcast, uh, the Insiders podcast this week, to Tim Costello, he's a uh, veteran humanitarian aid leader in Australia. Um, and we, you know, he's calling for an international investigation into this. He reckons the Australian Federal Police should even be involved in this. But, you know, he, he also explains 
uh, that's you know, a little concerning that it's taken this to shift that international uh, pressure on Israel? Well, I think it shows the um, mood of the moment, the sense that uh, we have crossed a line. Uh, um, Obama's advisor, Axelrod, said uh, this is a red line. This is mm. now murder of innocence. I might note that it's sad that we have retribalized so much that it takes a, the death of an Australian or an American for us to get to this point. That's, that's a reality, I suppose, uh, Katina, and you have seen Joe Biden um, exacting from Netanyahu some concessions. Yeah, yeah and that was quite a change from, from Biden in his language as well, yeah. and, and they made a point, the Americans, of briefing out that he, that he had been strong in his phone call with Netanyahu, saying, you know, our support is contingent on something changing. That was backed up with um, his, his national security spokesperson in a press mm -hmm. conference, um, and, and we saw the footage just before of him saying, well, yeah, they're now doing what, what we've asked them to. So, you know, there's been more aid points open and that sort of thing. But, it, it, yeah, there really has been a marked shift um, in the international community. And, David, on the point of mistakes happening, and I think the, to the point about what the coalition's response has been, what is missing in that is that some mistakes are preventable. And the question is, are they preventable mistakes? Were they preventable or not? And I don't think those responses necessarily include that, that, that issue. And that is the big issue. Could this have been avoided? Yes or no? That's what we need to know. Well, time to talk to the Shadow Foreign Minister, Simon Birmingham, uh, about this. As mentioned, the government's not happy with the level of accountability so far from Israel. It's appointing a special advisor to review Israel's investigation. International law professor Don Rothwell tells me this is unprecedented and demonstrates a serious intent to keep open a range of additional diplomatic, legal and political options for Australia. The Foreign Minister is demanding answers, and Ed Husick uh, too. The Coalition has been utterly silent on this or at other times been very weak, particularly this week, uh, in acknowledging that Israel crossed the line and that Zomi, uh, Frankham, paid the price for the crossing of that line. Simon Birmingham, welcome to the program. Hello, David. Good to be with you. So you called for a full and thorough investigation. You said the findings should be made transparent. Are you satisfied with what Israel has produced? David, the death of Zomi Frankham is clearly a tragedy, along with those of her colleagues working uh, for this humanitarian organisation. And it's a tragedy in a sea of tragedies that dates all the way back through to October 7, uh, when, of course, we saw another Australian, Gilad Carbone, uh, also killed at the hands, though, of Hamas, who instigated the cycle of violence that has been occurring since October 7 through their barbaric terrorist actions. And now, unlike Hamas, Israel does have processes and they have been stepping through those processes of investigation. They're not complete yet. Uh, interim findings have been made and provided, uh, but we want to see that there is clear action taken in terms of understanding how this tragedy occurred, importantly, how it will be prevented from occurring again in the future, because to see humanitarian aid flow into Gaza does require humanitarian workers to be able to operate safely there, and that requires Israel clearly to look carefully at the procedural failures that occurred uh, that, uh, that enabled this terrible tragedy to happen. So you still want more answers and more action? Well, we want to understand how procedures will change uh, to ensure that humanitarian workers can operate safely. Uh, and we respect that there are processes underway, but we expect those processes should continue to be transparent uh, and to understand the concern Australians legitimately have for the loss of an Australian life here uh, in Zomi Frankham, just as we were concerned, uh, and certainly from the coalition deeply concerned, and I personally visited the sites where mm. uh, Gilad Carbone uh, was barbarically murdered, along with so many others, by Hamas, and we shouldn't let the context of this conflict be lost. And that context is that you have in Hamas a terrorist organisation recognised as such here in Australia that is committed to the elimination of Israel, to its fight against the Jewish people, uh, and who killed more Jews on a single day than at any time since the Holocaust last year. Mm. Uh, and no country could or would live alongside that type of threat. Just on this incident, though, uh, Israel has stood aside two officers. Uh, three commanders have been reprimanded. Is that sufficient action? 
Well, that does show uh, some action and some accountability. And again, is it um, enough? We just can, well, David, there are continuing processes, I understand. Uh, I've had conversations with uh, Israel's ambassador to Australia to ensure that we understand the steps that are being taken. Of course, the government has a higher level of dialogue mm. with the Israeli government. But from your position, uh, it, it may not be enough? Well, the Israel itself are continuing to undertake processes. So we will have to see where those processes go in relation mm. to the accountability equation uh, for those who were involved in this strike as well as in relation to the change in procedure that is necessary to ensure that humanitarian workers can operate safely and humanitarian access can be provided safely into the people of Gaza. Do you support uh, the so idea of having this special advisor that uh, the, the foreign ministers announced to basically review how Israel is handling this? We'll have to see the details of what the role of this special advisor will be and who is appointed and how it is that they are expected to engage with the Israeli government. So uh, there's an announcement there, uh, but there are no details as yet from the Albanese government. Uh, when we see those details, we'll be able to have a more informed mm. consideration of it. But there might be a case to have someone uh, continuing to ask questions of Israel and keeping pressure on Israel? David, uh, our expectation is to see Israel continue the investigations they have underway, to use the processes mm. that they have, and for there to be transparency around that. And as I said, there are really Two issues there. One relates to accountability for this incident and how that is resolved. The other relates to changes to procedure to ensure that uh, other humanitarian workers, this is not the only tragedy to have occurred in this conflict uh, involving humanitarian aid workers. Uh, and of course, it's not the only tragedy mm. to have occurred in many other conflicts involving humanitarian aid workers. But there's a responsibility on Israel to make sure uh, that they respond with changes to their procedures to prevent such tragedies from happening again. Uh, and we want to see that all of those procedures uh, are followed appropriately. International human law says humanitarian relief personnel must be respected and protected. Do you think international humanitarian law has been followed here? Well, David, those will be part, logically, of the type of investigations and assessments being, uh, being undertaken. Obviously, this tragedy should not have occurred uh, and it should have been preventable. Uh, but this mistake, this accident, this tragedy has happened. That's why it's subject to these types of investigations. But I'm just asking if it's, it's a if it's a breach of international law, you're not sure at this stage? Well, you're asking me to give a legal judgment. Uh, I'm not either qualified nor in a position of all of the facts to give that legal judgment. Uh, what I will respect are the processes uh, that are underway. Uh, we want to make sure those processes are transparent uh, and they are uh, fully addressing those two different pillars that I've spoken about in relation to accountability around the incident and changes to procedures uh, to ensure that it is not repeated again. Uh, but none of us should mm. lose sight of the broader moral context in which uh, this war is being fought. I understand that. And that is that none of these points of, um, of process and equivalence apply to Hamas, uh, who killed an mm. Australian, along with, of course, 1,200 other people in barbaric circumstances. Uh, they don't have transparency. They don't have processes. They do still have up to 130 hostages who they continue to refuse to release. Uh, and they are continuing uh, to hide their terrorist operations and their war infrastructure behind and under civilian infrastructure and humanitarian workers and others within Gaza, which has only created a far greater death toll than would have been the case now, I... were they an entity operating mm. according to any type of standards or international law. I understand your criticism of Hamas. Uh, we, we hear that. I'm just wondering how willing you are to criticise Israel over this incident and more generally over its conduct in the war. On this incident, you've said you want to see procedures changed. You want to see more answers. You, you, you're not willing to judge whether this is indeed a breach of international law. Um, does it really fall into the category of mistakes that happen in war? David, uh, mistakes and tragedies do happen in war. But does this and, fit that uh, and it's category? It's naive for any of us to pretend uh, that they don't uh, and that innocent civilians haven't been killed by our forces, the forces of other nations and any other operating in a warlike con uh, context. That is uh, the terrible, terrible tragedy of war and why we should all work through as many 
diplomatic channels and in the building of effective deterrence, which involves having strong investment in your defence forces to avoid having uh, war. But However, does this, does the question is, like does this, this really uh, fall into that category? Uh, David, this is a tragedy. It shouldn't have happened. Uh, it is wrong that it happened. Uh, we've been very clear about that. We have expectations in terms of the investigations that should occur. Uh, but we also cannot turn away or be so naive as to pretend that tragedies and mistakes don't occur in war. They do. They happen all the time. It's a terrible thing. We wish it wasn't the case. And in this relation, uh, we seek to engage with Israel and we expect the Australian government to engage with Israel to understand how accountability can be had for the mistake that occurred and how it can be prevented in the future through changes to their procedures. More generally then, do you think Israel should take more care when it comes to the protection of civilian lives in Gaza? Well, I'd start by again noting that Israel takes more care than Hamas takes when it comes to protection of civilian lives. Hamas hides under civilians and amongst civilians I'm asking about in Israel the context though, of this war. Uh, now, Israel has responsibilities, as we have said from day one, uh, to uphold international law and to have regard uh, for that in the context uh, of this conflict. Uh, and they are uh, rightly held to account by many around the world in terms of that, uh, and that is a significant part of debate about how this conflict occurs. We would wish to see more and, and effective access of humanitarian aid into Gaza to help those who need it. That is a critical part of what mm. needs to occur and it's why necessary procedural action and steps should be adopted by Israel to ensure that humanitarian aid should flow. But we also would wish to see the hostages still held by mm. Hamas released. Uh, and that is something that, uh, that often seems to get overlooked in the public debate at present, uh, that Hamas continues to hold those hostages. Were they immediately and unconditionally released? we would actually have the circumstances for a ceasefire to actually be applied uh, and hopefully to move into more peaceful times. But, okay. but let me ask you this question. Let step. me ask you this question one more time. Do you think Israel needs to take greater care with the protection of civilian lives? Israel needs to take care with the protection of civilian lives. Greater care consistent than it currently consistent is. With, consistent with its obligations under international law, as we have said from uh, October 8 onwards. But uh, more there care was, than it has there been over the past six months? There was not conflict in Gaza on October 6. Hamas instigated that on October mm. 7. Uh, Israel has duties under international law and, and we are clear no, about we've that. We've heard that, that point. I'm just going to jump in one more time. More care than it has shown for the past six months? Well, clearly when mistakes like the one that has just occurred and other mistakes have happened as they do during war, Israel should be learning from each of those mistakes and making necessary okay. changes and procedures uh, to ensure that it is implying as safe an environment as possible for humanitarian workers, uh, for the protection of civilians who receive warnings, uh, who are provided with advice. But of course, uh, it is upon Israel in terms of the eyes of the world uh, to act with regard for international law. Uh, and that is a standard mm, that is okay. far higher than the standard applied um, uh, tragically uh, to a terrorist organisation and that's why that terrorist organisation needs to be removed from any position of influence, governance or threat uh, such that we can actually move into a more peaceful negotiation environment in the future. A few other issues uh, while we've got you here. Tonga is hosting a Pacific Islands forum uh, a little later this year. Its Prime Minister says they're open to an offer from China to help with security for the event. Um, he says there's nothing to be concerned about here, but how concerned are you about it? I think these are concerning reports. Uh, the Pacific Islands Forum is a, a very critical piece of our regional diplomatic architecture. Uh, and when Pacific Island Forum leaders meet, uh, we should expect that the security and other logistics for those meetings are provided by Pacific Islands Forum countries. Uh, if there is a suggestion that China is going to be providing that security or other logistics, then I think that would be concern to many PIF member nations. Mm. And the Albanese government needs to be clear as to how it has potentially come to this and what steps it is taking to make sure that Tonga is provided with all of the additional and necessary support so that PIF member nations are providing the security and logistics for those PIF meetings to occur. 
Another boatload of suspected asylum seekers uh, has apparently arrived on the, um, off the Kimberley coastline there. It's uh, reported that they're citizens from China. Do people from China deserve protection? Uh, uh, David, consideration of protection is, uh, is done according to the legal frameworks around uh, refugee environments. Uh, however, uh, this is the third boat since November that appears to have made it to the Australian mainland potentially not only making it to the Australian mainland, but uh, offloading passengers and then departing without any detection uh, of that boat uh, happening. Uh, this is a big indictment on the Albanese government if that is the case, that boats are making it to the mainland and departing with increasing frequency without detection. And it comes at a time where the evidence provided to Senate committees and procedures shows that uh, we have a reduction in relation to maritime surveillance, a reduction in relation to aerial surveillance, concerns about the future budget projections for Operation Sovereign Borders and a government that had dismantled the temporary protection visas pillar uh, of those arrangements. So the Albanese government needs to acknowledge uh, if there are increasing failures here, uh, those problems, their responsibility and act to fix them. The government is trying to strengthen migration laws in relation to those who won't cooperate uh, when they're here with immigration officials. Uh, it's legislation it uh, introduced to Parliament nearly two weeks ago. Have you yet found any problems that you're concerned about in this proposed new law? Well, David, what we saw a couple of weeks ago felt very much like a try-on from the Albanese government. Uh, they had twice brought emergency migration legislation to the Parliament. Uh, the first one for electronic surveillance of individuals and it's subsequently been revealed that many of the individuals who could be captured by this are not subject to that electronic surveillance. The second one for a form of preventative detention orders and it's subsequently been revealed that no preventative detention orders have been sought by the Albanese government. So uh, forgive the approach when the third attempt came along uh, and the government weren't direct or clear about what the urgency of it were, was. Uh, when they had legislation that they'd been sitting on for at least days before they presented it to the Parliament, hmm. that we believed that more than 36 hours' worth of scrutiny uh, was warranted have you found for any that problems? Just, just quickly on this, have you found any problems, though, in two weeks on? It's going through the proper process of a Senate committee right. inquiry now. We made sure that committee reports before the very next sitting day. Uh, so okay. if the government wants it considered then, it will be ready to be considered then. Uh, but it's the standard process, submissions are being invited uh, from interested parties uh, and we will then hear from okay. appropriate witnesses in that pr process. A, a final one, uh, and this is about someone who actually is an Australian citizen, Yusuf Zahab. He was 12 years old when his family took him to live under Islamic State in, uh, in Syria back in 2015. For years uh, he was thought to be dead along with the rest of his family. Turns out he's alive. This is uh, a pretty extraordinary story uncovered by SBS Dateline uh, program. They've tracked him down in a Syrian jail. Uh, he's being held there without charge. He's been stuck there for years. Should Australia be trying harder to bring him home? There are enormous complexities when it comes to, uh, to the situation in Syria. Uh, complexities in terms of safety, access, uh, the type of diplomatic relations that, uh, that frankly don't exist and they are challenges faced not only by Australia but by countries like Canada as well. Uh, and then beyond those complexities uh, there are the security assessments in relation to individuals uh, who have spent a long time embedded with Islamic State fighters and, uh, and the threats that are posed there. Now on this particular case uh, the opposition hasn't had briefings from the government about this individual and his circumstances so it's for okay. the government to speak as to what they know and what could or couldn't be done but we do understand the the breadth of complexities there and the right. paramount responsibility to also ensure that australia and australian officials are kept safe through those processes simon birmingham we'll have to leave it there but thanks for joining us this morning thanks david my pleasure coming up australia's next governor general sam moston why was she chosen first let's continue this conversation with the panel back to karen middleton paul sakal and katina curtis uh, look, just quickly on Israel before we move on, um, I think it is notable that Karen Simon Birmingham is also saying they need more information, more answers from Israel. He is, but he's being very careful not to criticise Israel. Yeah. He is not criticising, he is raising questions, but he's not criticising Israel. I think a couple of things, David, come from that interview for me. One is I'm slightly bothered by the use of the word tragedy 
Um, the coalition is using it very carefully. The Australian government has used that word. The Israeli government has used that word. Now, it's tragic, of course, that people are killed. But that word sort of carries the implication that no one is responsible. It's the sort of word we use when there's an accident that no one's really responsible for. And I, I find that slightly problematic because I think we do want to know who was responsible in this case. So I'm just interested in the choice of that word deliberately by so many people that, and whether that is kind of sending our minds to, or well, it happens. So there's that. There's also the bigger question about what Israel's trying to achieve. It, it has said two things. It, it, it wants to rescue the hostages mm. and it wants to ensure that Hamas can never launch such an attack again. Now, Simon Birmingham used interesting language. He said, Hamas needs to be removed from any position of influence, governance and threat. And that is the issue, because the question now is, can Israel achieve its objectives which are completely legitimate objectives, in, in, given what happened on October 7, in the manner that it is seeking to do it at the moment. The way it is waging this war, can it actually achieve those objectives without completely obliterating Gaza and the people, the Palestinian people? Mm. This is the question the international com community must grapple with, Israel must grapple with. Mm. Can it achieve what it wants to, or, or does it need to approach it and achieve it in a different yeah, way? And I think w worth noting that what Simon, the essence of what Simon Birmingham is trying to do is to ensure that Hamas doesn't achieve its objectives, which are a bit less, less full, fully formed. But there was an interview in the New York Times in November where a Hamas leader said the 10,000 deaths that had happened to that point were not seen as a tragedy. They were seen as a necessary byproduct to put this issue back into the public spotlight into the we in the West and, and, to diminish, of, and to diminish the status of Israel. There's a so question that, of culpability on the yeah, part of Hamas absolutely. as well, of course. And of course. Simon Birmingham's emphasising Hamas's yeah, role yeah, and lab, Labor MPs pass over Hamas's role commonly when they speak yeah. on this issue. Let's move on. The migration laws. Uh, it is nearly a couple of weeks on since the government sprung this on the parliament. Uh, they weren't able to rush it through as quickly as they wanted to. There's now this Senate inquiry, the Prime Minister during the week, uh, arguing these are very practical, common sense changes. We put forward uh, practical legislation before the parliament to deal with the gap that has been there in the legislation for some period of time. Katina, is it practical common sense or is this a, a rather more serious step that they're taking? I think there's a few things. I mean, the, the laws that they want to introduce are very sweeping. Um, they again contain mandatory minimum sentences, um, which Labor kind of feels like maybe they had that fight internally uh, with the rush laws last year. And not only that, if, if someone refuses to cooperate, mandatory minimum sentence, at the end of that, if they're still refusing to cooperate with immigration... They go around again. Right. They can have another... <laughs> as I understand it, have another one. Um, but on the other hand, they were trying to get ahead of this High Court case that's being heard um, in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, that is now, they're happy to say that privately. No one will say it publicly because... Why, why, why not? Why aren't they publicly Because I was saying? asking questions about this this week. It's, it's basically any time there's a legal case, and the minister in particular, but the government more broadly is quite... It, it feel that their hands are quite tied in what they can say publicly. They don't publicly. want to jeopardise their They don't want to jeopardise okay. anything they say is scrutinised by the lawyers. But it does seem clear that they were trying to get ahead of this case, which um, the Attorney-General Mark Dreyfus, in fact, asked the High Court to hear rather than a lower-level court. And it is looking at this question of, um, you know, whether someone who doesn't cooperate can be seen to, you know, what happens with their detention. Is it fair that they be held in immigration detention? And I, th I think this, the sentiment seems to be... We had um, constitutional law expert George Williams this week saying he thinks the government probably will win that case. The government thinks that politically the coalition is betting on them winning that case so that the, the blowback from not having these laws in place doesn't fall onto the coalition. Yes, because if the government lost, there'd be you know, a lot of questions to the coalition. Why didn't you rush through these laws? But um, the opposition, it seems, Paul, are happy to drag this out a little longer. Yeah. Um, the, the tactical error that Labor made last sitting week when they failed to realise that the coalition would push this out, it was embarrassing, hugely embarrassing on the week, but it's also opened this, uh, and the coalition's very happy about this, this massive can of worms inside the Labor Party and in the refugee kind of advocacy yeah. community and the, and the diaspora communities. MPs are being bombarded with emails at the moment with people concerned about how this uh, 
blacklist of countries may so work this is in the other, community. Yeah, this, yeah, this designating countries so no one can come here from that country yeah. like Iran, for example. Exactly. And this is all going to be fleshed out in the inquiry. There are Labor MPs who are concerned about it. In the caucus meeting where this was revealed, they all got a sheet of paper and they read the reforms and Jerome Laxale, who's an outspoken and pretty brave um, Sydney MP, immediately stood up and he was like, whoa. Not sure about this. <laughs> and because this has been dragged on for a while now, Labor MPs will be speaking to their constituents, speaking to the interest groups. And this will be an internal problem for Andrew Giles now. And, and Clara Neal. There's particular concerns around the definition of family and who mm. who is or isn't in, in family. There's some suggestion that as the laws are written, it might exclude mm. parents or grandparents from being able to apply for visas mm. coming from those countries. So it's pretty broad. Well, I, I, I did ask the um, Home Affairs Minister and the Immigration Minister to uh, join us on the program. Neither was available, but hopefully soon. There's an issue with the speed of this legislation, David, I think, because... Sometimes when legislation is pushed through very quickly, there can be things hidden in it that have wider consequences. We don't really know the breadth of the application of this, how, who, who it might affect. People who've been here for a long time who haven't regularised their status and become Australian citizens might be affected. We're not sure. It's also dangerous because there can be unintended consequences. There can be mistakes in legislation that is rammed through quickly. Often there is. I would say most of the time there are little mistakes that need to be fixed. And this is what the Scrutiny of Bills Committee, as it's called, highlighted, and that has three Labor senators on it, and they were yep. pretty pertinent in the yep. criticisms they raised about what's been put forward here. So we'll see where it goes. Look, Australia's uh, new next Governor-General has been named. Uh, Sam Mostyn will take over from David Hurley from July, and she's certainly looking forward to the role. I can think of no greater purpose, Prime Minister, than to serve this country I love as Governor-General particularly at a time in our history when the challenges and opportunities we face are large and complex. So, Katina, who is Sam Mostyn and why was she chosen? So she's got a very broad CV. Um, she is, has sat on the boards uh, of quite a number of companies in a huge range of fields. Um, she's been an AFL commissioner and she was instrumental in getting the AFLW off the ground. Um, more recently, she's perhaps become more publicly known as an advocate for gender equality. Um, she's generally happy to speak out on, on a range of issues. Um, I think that the, the word that's come up the most uh, in discussions about her appointment has been interesting um, and a sense from people who perhaps don't agree with the political views that she's held of wait and see how she actually conducts herself in the role because the Governor General of course is supposed to be pretty impartial, um, apolitical and that kind of thing. And it's interesting actually you know that there's a lot of been discussion around what how different she is. Almost all of our Governor Generals have been either judges or military um, men, apart from the, the British Lords They've early on. They've all been men, apart from well, Quentin Bryce. Apart from Quentin Bryce, but actually the person whose CV she, hers most resembles is Quentin Bryce, like with that sort of hmm. broad, you know, broad community aspects in sport, community life, business life. And, and, look, and, and she's um, at a younger age than I think a lot of yep. appointees often are, and we're also in an age now of social media as well, and some of the things on social media have uh, certainly raised concerns for some on the right uh, over this appointment, Paul. Yeah, there were some tweets from, I think, 2020, where she called Australia Day Invasion Day. Ah, uh, but I think we need to be careful because there is a bit of a suggestion that some of these may have actually been doctored hmm. and we don't know for sure. So I think... That one in particular. That one um, in particular, there, there is a suggestion that not all of that tweet may have right. been the original tweet. And I, I do think... I mean, she was vetted. I'd be she surprised if that wasn't picked up. If, yeah, if she that was vetted. Was Apparently real. the sweep found no yeah. issues uh, around, Sorry to around that. No, that's anyway, fine. It's interesting. There was no denial on that and it was, it was, it was viewable in a, in a way back machine um, internet archive, which is uh, tr true to form. So, I, I mean, I've seen it with my own eyes, but perhaps... I'm missing something. I don't know. Yeah. The difficulty that Sam Mostyn's in now is she can't really she speak can't and address yeah. these criticisms. So yeah. the criticisms can come and she can't really yeah. respond to them. Yeah, and look, there was criticism too of uh, deleting social media accounts, but um, that's actually protocol, as I understand it, from both the Palace and yeah. Government House, that yeah. you can't, once you're appointed, you can't be out there having public commentary. That means you've got to get... And this is a new age that we're in, right? So you've got to get rid of those accounts from that, that point onwards. Um, what sort of Governor-General she'll be, though, I suppose, is the, the more important question here. You, you can't be an activist, as Katina says, but you can, depending on who's in the role, you can reflect you know, uh, the, the direction and the character of Australia. Yeah, I think that's really important, is understanding the values of the, of the nation and representing it properly. I, I think, you know, if you were going to 
list of some criteria, things like um, it, your temperament, you know, you want someone who's calm, you want someone who's considered, you want someone who's compassionate, you know, maybe mm. I didn't mean all C's, but, you know, but, you know, these are the sorts of things I think we would say we want in a Governor-General. And to Katina's point, the, the question is not necessarily the views they have expressed and held, although people will obviously look to those and that vetting process would look to those and there might be... There's, I'm sure there's a line somewhere where, you know, they would say, actually, no, that person's not suitable. But it's how they choose to demonstrate their views and values once they're in the job. And there have been some criticisms of, of previous Governors-General for being perhaps too outspoken in a range of ways. Uh, and I think what we want in a Governor-General is someone who understands the, the position, who understands the hierarchy. Certainly governments appoint people they think understand what motivates them, and governments always do that. But you've also got a pretty important constitutional function here yeah. too. And if we are headed for a hung parliament minority government situation after the next election or the one after that, um, this, this person in that job uh, could play a pretty critical role. Yeah, most people have um, pretty little, limited understanding of what the Governor General does and probably who it is, but that will obviously change if we have a hung parliament. Um, I think another point worth mentioning on Moston's appointment, putting aside the anti-woke and anti-anti-woke reaction, which is all a bit <laughs> boring these around. days. Like ping pong. Um, it, it, it was seen by Labor people as another kind of signal. I don't, I'm not suggesting this was Anthony Albanese's sole focus or even high priority, but seen as another signal to the kind of professional working women cohort of Australia, which is a really important part of Labor's electoral base now. It's kind of Labor's new working class base. And Anthony Albanese in his first budget, you can trace this back to his first budget reply speech, all about childcare. Mm. Caddy Gallagher is the exemplar of this in the government, speaking to women about practical issues. Mm. And their numbers among women, if you look at News Poll and Resolve, are remaining really strong. They're terrible for the coalition. They were terrible for the coalition at the last election. And the Liberal Party is doing very little on and pre elections. started pointing out at every opportunity possible how that they're a majority female government now. Yep. Yeah. And look, whenever something happens with uh, Governor General, the question always comes up: When are we going to get a republic? Will this be the last Governor General? I doubt it. Uh, listen to Anthony Albanese's um, language on this. It's it's really not a priority for him now, is it? No, I don't think it can be a, a high priority for him now. He's getting too close to the next election, and he, he w was burnt on his voice referendum. Yeah. So I'm not sure that he'd He's want not to go to bowl up a, yeah, another yeah, referendum. No. Question. But to the point, the constitutionality point and the role of the Governor General. I think we saw that come back into focus with the revelations about Scott Morrison's secret ministries yep. and the questions raised about the role of the Governor-General there. I'm sure this will be a front of mind issue and question for Sam Mostyn and the government. Yeah. It should sort of circumstances arise. I can't imagine this government would repeat what Scott Morrison did give, given the fallout from that. But there is yeah. a question about when a Governor-General is prepared to push back on a government and what that looks like. And these are all questions we sort of don't really have clear answers. Well, to. yeah, hopefully if the Prime Minister's being secretly appointed to uh, ministries, the Governor-General might actually uh, let us know I about I think it. that was the conclusion yep. the public came to. Yep. Uh, a couple of other things. I mentioned this boat arrival uh, earlier with Simon Birmingham. It's the third in five months off that rather large coastline, Katina. Yep. Is, it, is it obvious now that we are seeing people smugglers really trying that route? Um, pretty, yeah, so there definitely hard. seems to be a changing tactic. Um, the boat arrival this weekend is in the same area as the one last November. Um, the one in February was cl much closer to Broome, which you say, oh, it's broadly in the Kimberley region. Okay, they're about, they're more than 800 kilometres apart. It's a huge coastline. It's like Canberra yeah. to Melbourne, right? Um, the people in the area uh, say there is a huge increase in um, illegal fishing boats and we are actually seeing that agriculture department authorities uh, have picked up and um, turned back uh, also a huge number of illegal fishing boats. Um, the people oh, in the sector... There's a lot of traffic around there. Absolutely. There's people in the sector say, you know, they've seen evidence of um, probably fishermen camping out on some of the small islands in the area, picking up rubbish and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, and they just say there's there's so much traffic, there's, there's no way that the authorities can really be keeping on top of it. There's an interesting question being raised about whether they're also no longer using the, rick the rickety fishing boat mm. that they know will be sunk, but maybe they're using fast vehicles yeah, to, to drop them actually out. close to the shoreline yeah, and, yeah. and disappear. And I, I don't know the veracity of that suggestion, but I've seen it made and I think that's interesting. That goes to Katina's And it's incredibly point. remote and we know police in WA are looking still for uh, one man out there somewhere uh, who became separated from the group. Final one, uh, supermarkets. This has been really interesting. 
The Greens have been for a while saying we need this divestiture, this break-up power to force the break-up of Coles and Woolies if they're misusing their market power. The Nationals jumped on board. Peter Dutton said, oh, we're not going to be led by the Greens on this sort of thing. But now he's uh, seems to be coming in behind the idea as well. I believe very strongly that if there's market failure uh, in a particular market and consumers are being adversely impacted, then I think in that circumstance uh, you would look at uh, whether or not that market domination would continue. Paul, where's this heading? There's an increase in bolshiness um, in the coalition backbench, uh, pushing the party towards, you know, taking a more anti-business, anti-corporate anti stance on how they run the economy. There's pressure there. Angus Taylor is not as comfortable some of, as some of these backbenchers taking on big business. But in shadow cabinet last week, there was a discussion around these divestiture laws. It's actually been national party policy for a long time. Mm. They didn't piggyback off the Greens. They've actually right. been keen on this for a long time. Liberals haven't. Um, but David Littleproud seems to have convinced Peter Dutton and Angus Taylor to go down this path. Um, Dutton, Taylor and Littleproud are working on a policy. They've agreed on broad principles. Details yet to be sorted out. David Littleproud went out a bit early and kind of claimed credit, which upset some Liberal shadow cabinet ministers. Littleproud's under pressure from Barnaby Joyce supporters to get this done. They're constantly There's undermining. There's a lot going on there. There's a bit going the on. The government, by the way, they're not keen on divestiture powers. Albanese calls them Soviet style. Jim Chalmers, I think, is giving a speech this week at an ACCC event, a competition watchdog event, uh, where he'll talk about merger laws. We'll also, it's expected, get the Craig Emerson report on uh, whether the supermarket grocery code of conduct should be made mandatory. I assume that will be the recommendation, but uh, it's not going as far as breaking up the big no, guys. And I think Peter Dutton makes an interesting point, raises an interesting question when he talks about some of the other behaviours So that, that sort of goes around that divestiture question a bit, at like whether big supermarkets are kind of buying up land in certain areas yeah. that, that make it physically impossible for other... Uh, other competitors to get near. So, what, what, breaking down what is involved in the so-called monopolies and how are they operating, and is there are there other levers that can be pulled short of divestiture that can at least prevent that sort of thing from occurring? So, I do think it's an interesting debate to be had. Yeah. All right. Well, our panel: Karen Middleton, Paul Sakal, and Katina Curtis will be back very shortly with some final observations. Time now, though, for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with cartoonist for The Age in the Sydney Morning Herald, Megan Herbert, and a very warm welcome to Talking Pictures. Thank you. It's so good to be here, Mike. Megan, it's only autumn, but already the government seems to be suffering its winter of discontent. True. Although I would always take a winter of discontent over a nuclear winter. Yes. You, uh, you seem to think that the government is playing an elbow fool's joke with these headlines here. Labor rushes refugee ban bill. Offshore gas bill debate gagged. Secret draft of LGBT plus laws. And the uh, punters here going... What the...? <laughs> As elbow passes by. I've never actually heard him whistle. How do you think it would go? Something sort of jaunty to walk the dog with. You've captured Toto here perfectly. It's fun to draw a Toto. It is. Oh, wait, I get it, right? April Fools. Ha <laughs> ha, classic. And, uh, yes, he's looking very nervous there. The wonderful Fiona Kataskis has got the Rocky Horror Picture Show here with a little ode to the Time War. State Street Tax Cats, it's just a jump to the left. And then ten steps to the right. Ay, 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 ay. You put your hands on your ears. And close your eyes up tight. And it's the lack of trust. That really drives us insane. Please don't do the time warp again. I was wondering if there, if there was a moment I missed when they altered the ALP acronym to Alternative Liberal Party. <laughs> Brett Lethbridge has got the Easter money. <laughs> Slowly melting here the primary vote. Yes, and Jim Chalmers has got that thousand yard stare that all parents of small children will recognise at the end of Chocolate Weekend. <laughs> He's looking very worn out. Megan, the war in Gaza has uh, already led to too many civilian deaths, but this week the death of an Australian aid worker really hit close to home. David Rowe has the switchboard operator as the, uh, the Grim Reaper here. Mr Albanese, please hold. Miss Wong, please hold. Mr Biden, Mr Netanyahu, line two, apologies. Mr Trudeau, please hold. Mr Albanese, please hold, etc, etc, etc. Just patching you through to complicity. 
Yeah. Hold the political line, please. Yeah, I wonder if they called collect. Yeah. David Pope, in the way that he always does, really sums it up quite well that the international humanitarian law is just a flat facade yeah. that can fall over Buster Keaton style at the first available uh, look behind the door. Exactly. I did love this, Dyson, unintended strike. Yes, Tasmania seems to have fallen down the back of the couch of complacency, which is yep. going to cause some upset somewhere, I'm sure. Yep. <laughs> it's that realisation that we don't seem to pay attention until a so-called unintended strike strikes closer to home. She's been a lawyer, a businesswoman, an AFL commissioner, and now Sam Mostyn's becoming our Governor-General. Yes. Um, I've often wondered, is becoming a Republican Governor-General a bit like being an atheist priest, or...? <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful Mark Knight. When I offered the job of Governor-General, the former AFL commissioner, Sam Mostyn, despite being a Republican, took the grab, and she's uh, doing the big specky on his shoulders. Yes, the big question, of course, is will she be able to live up to Linda Hurley's spectacular half-time performances? Megan, just when you thought Bruce Lehrman incident couldn't get any grubbier, yeah. someone says, hold my beer, and um, the wonderful John Kadelka has commented on it. He's got Lehrman here at the front with the seven steam cleaning. Mate, you're never getting your bond back, as this is his bin fire and smoking ruin here. Yes, particularly poor form at a time when most people can barely find a rental property. The seven steam cleaning, you could send that uh, round to a lot of people involved in this. It's really. been very busy. Look, it's been a great pleasure having you on uh, Talking Pictures and I'll let you do the honours. Thank you, it's been an honour, Mike. Back to you, David. Thank you, Megan, thank you, Mike. Let's get some final observations, Katina. Uh, WA Liberals yesterday had their pre-selection in Tangy. Uh, Mark Wales, former SAS veteran and survivor competitor, uh, won. Um, it's the second of the pre-selections for the seats the Libs want to pick up. Both men were chosen. Um, WA Senate next week, uh, probably going to be two men topping the ticket because they're the incumbents. The Liberals didn't pick a woman in Cook. They didn't pick a woman in Dunkley. They didn't pick a woman in Forest. They didn't pick a woman in Fadden, they didn't pick a woman in McPherson, it's you know, it's there. pretty overwhelming. I think that they, 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 everyone keeps telling them they've got a problem, even Tony Abbott, as Paul wrote about, but mm. they're not listening. Paul? Yeah, 18 out of 26 pre-selections have gone to men so far. Um, speaking of men in the Liberal Party, there's been a long time Duchess in of Mike Baird to run the seat of Warringah. Years. Um, yeah, it's still going. He hasn't made his mind up for this time. He's an outside chance waiting for the redistribution. Um, so we might get an answer in the next few months. Um, Paul Erickson, the Labor National Secretary, has been asked by senior people across the party to run for the Senate vacancy in Victoria. Ooh. He said no because he's got an election to do. He's very highly rated, though, and we might see him in the parliament in the next few years. Taking one for the team and staying to run the, uh, run the campaign. Karen. There's an Australian in jail in Iraq, Robert Pepper, who's been there for three years. In fact, it's three years today mm. since he was arrested and convicted and jailed. He worked for a consulting firm that was consulting to the Central Bank of Iraq. There was a problem there. He and an Egyptian colleague were jailed. He also faces a massive multi-million dollar fine. The family are now seeking to raise his voice. They're concerned that not enough is being done. The government says 160 representations, I think, have been made to, on his behalf for, through bureaucracy. My understanding is the Prime Minister's also written to his counterpart, um, but the government does make the point, and I think Penny Wong or a spokesperson has made the point today that there's a limit to what can be done by a foreign government into, intervening in a... In a uh, another judicial system. But there's obviously a huge amount of concern for his health and well-being. His health is deteriorating. The family is concerned. So another case of an Australian in jail and they're seeking public support. All right. Thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Finally, anyone following US politics will know Donald Trump has been boasting of his golfing successes lately. He won two tournaments on his own golf course and he took to social media to let everyone know. Comedians and Joe Biden have been having a field day ever since. We'll leave you with that. Thanks for watching. Donald Trump, as far as we can tell, has just been trying to win a third championship at his own golf course. My question to you, sir, can voters trust a presidential candidate who has not won a single Trump International Golf Club trophy? At long last, sir, have you no chip shot? Well, look, I'd be happy to play. I told him this before when he came into the Oval when he was being, before he got sworn in. I said, I'll give you three strokes if you carry your own bag. You're making us all feel very excited about being here.